The incident I'm going to share with you is all about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This happened in North Pole, Alaska. No one believes it was unprovoked. I was in the army. And if you live in barracks, you have to keep your weapons in the army room. So it's not like it's convenient to get that out and carry compared to a guy living off post who can keep his gun in a safe in a closet. I know people will still wonder why I wasn't carrying those. But anyway, here's my story. On the night of El Cinco de Mayo, I attended a party at a friend's house in North Pole, Alaska. North Pole is about half hour outside of Fairbanks. It's a somewhat rural community. Lots of houses that are on one to two acre lots and mostly all dirt roads off the main road. I was the designated driver that night and drove four of my friends, but three of the friends that I bought decided they were going to spend the night at that person's house instead of returning to the barracks. Only one friend that wasn't drinking a lot decided that he wanted to go to the barracks when I was ready to go. We ended up leaving at 1.30 am. As we're pulling into the front gate, we got a call that there had been a fight at the party. They said after the fight, everyone was going home instead of staying the night and continuing to drink. So they asked us to come back and pick them up, but said that they had went to a different friend's house that lived in the same area because everyone had to leave after the fight. Well, GPS doesn't work that well once you get outside of Fairbanks and aren't on the main roads, at least not with my Verizon service that night. You could get to the general area, but not the exact location. When we went to the address that was given, it came up as being in the middle of the road. So we took a turn down a side road so that we could get service in order to make the call and figure out which house it was. It was 2.30 at this point. As we turned down the road, there was an old red minivan with fog lights mounted on top, just idling, and two guys that looked to be in their late 20s inside. I remember thinking that it looked like something you'd see in a TV show or horror movie. Just a really creepy looking van, especially at almost three in the morning. We had to pass them to turn around, and they looked at us in a way that gave us a very bad feeling. So we turned around and had to pass them again to pull out onto the main road. As we passed them, the driver was leaning his head out of the window like he wanted us to stop so that he could ask us something. Being that it was almost 3am, we knew it was probably best to continue driving. My friend wasn't able to get hold of anyone, so he tried mapping it out again, but the GPS was delayed due to poor service, and we missed the turn again. We saw a small clearing to pull over, so we pulled over on the side of the road to verify where we were compared to the street we missed. About 10 seconds after, the same red minivan with the fog lights mounted pulled up next to us on my driver's side and rolled down the window. This time, I rolled mine down, and they initiated the conversation by asking if we had seen a white Dodge pickup. We said we hadn't, and they thanked us. And we asked if they knew where Meadow Rue, the street we were looking for, was located. They said it was the first street on the left if we headed back the way we came. We were suspicious, but when we looked at the GPS, it showed that it was that road. We found out later that the road was on both sides of the main road. Note, locals outside of Fairbanks tend to not like the active duty military guys, and military guys stick out a lot due to the lack of beard and long hair, and having a military haircut. We started heading towards Meadow Rue, which was about half mile away, and saw them pull out and start heading out that way behind us. We made the turn to what we thought was Meadow Rue, and this road is a bumpy dirt road and immediately forks off into two directions. One side goes straight and up a slight hill, 
and the other side is off to the left and drops down about two feet and flattens out. We turned left and dropped down the small incline. The road was narrow, only big enough for one car and lined with trees on both sides for a good distance. The first thing we noticed was a dead end sign. And that's when we started to get worried. We drove about 20 feet. And then we see the minivan with fog lights turn in and drop down behind us. At this point, my blood turned cold. And I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. I knew at this point that they were following us. I tried to be positive and hoped for a split second that they'd be hanging back and turn off at the first driveway, which we hadn't even seen yet. But then I saw them speeding up. Again, this is a bumpy dirt side street and there's no reason to be going fast. I started speeding up too, and they slammed into the back of my car, backed off and rammed me again. A few seconds later, we made it to a small clearing in a little dirt cul-de-sac. I had enough room to pull forward and then reverse myself back so that I was facing the direction I had just came. While I was doing this, they stopped and blocked the one lane dirt road. They hopped out the car and shouted, This ain't Meadow Rue, get out the car. The one guy had positioned himself directly in front of my car, 10 to 15 feet away between the trees and his van. The other guy started walking up to my passenger side where my friend was. They kept shouting at us to get out. I just gunned it right at the guy in front of me trying to run him over. He managed to jump out of the way. I thought for sure there wasn't going to be enough room between his van and the trees and figured we'd get stuck. But we had no weapons. So there wasn't a better choice. I thought we'd have to bail out and run into the woods and hide. But to my surprise, we squeezed through. It was such a tight fit that both my mirrors collapsed in. And then I sped out of there, got onto the main road and headed home. I had seen a state trooper not long before this, not too far down the road. I was scared to death of being chased again, and then run off the road at higher speed. So instead of slowing down, I blew past the state trooper doing 90 and a 45. Since this is extreme speeding, I would thought I'd get the troopers attention. But for whatever reason, I didn't. There was only one turn on the whole way back. And when I slowed down to make it the van was nowhere in sight. I still flew back at 90 all the way back just to be safe. The next day we tried to tell our friends what had happened. Nobody believed us not one person. They thought we didn't feel like driving all the way back to pick them up. So we made up some story to get out of it. The guy who had invited us all over originally said that if we were serious that we needed to go file a police report with the Alaska State Troopers. So we went to do that. When we filed the report after giving our story to the trooper, he told us to wait and then left the room. About 15 minutes later, he came back in and told us to tell the truth. Confused, we asked him what he meant. And he said his theory was that we were drunk, driving around late at night after the Cinco de Mayo party, and we plowed into the van we described. He said he thought the owner heard that happen, and then came out and confused. So we took off. He said to get ahead of the story, we made up the whole thing. So we wouldn't get in trouble for wrecking into the car while drunk and leaving the scene. We repeatedly told him this was not the case and said everything that we told him was true. Without evidence to prove his theory, though, he let us go. The next day he went and checked the area we showed him on the map. I guess when he didn't find a wrecked car, he knew we were most likely telling the truth. He called and asked us to come meet him out there to verify it was the area. But we told him we didn't want to go near there again. About two weeks later after that, he called and asked us to come back in and possibly ID the vehicle. He showed us a picture of a red minivan with fog lights. And we said that it looked like the vehicle from the incident. He told us that this vehicle was stolen out of Neneka, Alaska, some time before that, 
and it was stolen from an old woman. The guys may or may not have been related to her, and the trooper said if any arrests were made, he would call us back, but we never heard any follow-up after that. To this day, no one really believes my story. They think we did something to provoke the incident or just made it up to sound cool or whatever. But it was just a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I live in rural Australia, and this happened quite a few years ago, but is a story worth telling. The layout of our property consisted of a fairly standard four bedroom house and a massive shed that my dad used to keep all his furniture, machinery and tools in. This shed was around 100 meters from the house and had those lights that takes a while to warm up before lighting up properly. So I was around 17 at the time. It was the middle of winter and it was getting dark at around 6 p.m. I was just finishing up working on my car in the driveway when from the work shed, I hear my mum in a panic, scream for help. I sprinted up to the shed, the yelling continuing the whole time. I assumed she had walked into the shed for something and instead of bothering with waiting for the lights, she walked in the dark and tripped on something. I ran into the shed and hit the lights, grabbing a torch because it was pitch black inside. This closed the shed. I heard my mum yell my name once more clearly, in pain and coming from the far side of the shed. I started walking my way back to the shed, yelling to my mum, but not getting any replies. When I get about halfway, my dad sticks his head in the door and asks what I'm yelling about. I'm telling him about mum being in trouble and he pauses and quickly tells me to get out of the shed and that mum is fine. Absolutely and completely confused, I walk back to the door of the shed and both of us walk back to the house. I'm shaken and I keep telling him I swear mum is hurt in the shed. When we get back to the house, mum walks out the front door drying her hair with a towel after getting out the shower. I didn't know how to react. I explained to both of them what happened and they both brush it off saying it was weird, but that I probably imagined it. That weekend, my older sister who moved out two years before this event came home for a visit. Sitting on the grass besides the house and the shed, I told her what happened and she went white and told me that a few years before she moved out, the exact same thing happened to her when she got home from work one night, except mum called my sister's phone when she was in the shed, wanting to know what she wanted for dinner. My sister never told a soul about her experience, only refused to ever go into the shed again. We both wondered what we would have found if we'd have gone to the back where the voice came from. I'm from Slovakia, a little state in Central Europe. I had lived there for 20 years and I never heard about this topic until quite recently. You see, there's a very strange forest in the westish part of the country named Tribec. First time I ever found out about the place was from a movie trailer about the topic. I was bamboozled when they wrote it was based on true events. Like this is a small country and people are kind of conservative. But anyway, Nothing much ever happened in our country that I would consider paranormal by any means. I discovered that there's an almost Bermuda Triangle kind of place with a big twist. You see people mysteriously disappear, but they also appear weeks, even months later, in completely different locations, disoriented with severe cuts and burns on their hands and legs. The cuts are completely different sizes and depths. It's important to mention, people are not always found, but if they are, this state of disorientation or insanity is very common. Allegedly, this little spot, this forest in the middle of nowhere, is full of crosses with scary, unexplained pasts, abandoned villages left to decay castle ruins no one can remember. 
It's a very favorite famous tourist attraction. But people, even though they know nothing about the place, are reporting feeling lost, disoriented, losing track of time, disappearing and reappearing in places they'd never been. They even start going missing. The season tends to happen between November and March. Even the Slovakian media covered these stories several times, but not frequently. The most famous case I can remember is about a German man named Walter Fischer. He went into the forest for a hike to Black Castle. He never returned. So his wife went to the police to search for him. And months didn't go by. But a year later, he was found in another part of this forest, bleeding with several weird burns on his body. He was taken to hospital. And from there to a psychiatric unit, because he went totally bananas, and was blabbering about lights that kept him company about different dimensions, and other stuff like that. Bear in mind, he was completely normal before he stepped foot into the forest. The latest story, as far as I'm aware, was from 2017. When a boy was lost, and they found him after several weeks injured and fainted. He was brought to the hospital, but passed due to his injuries. He had cuts on his hands and bare feet, as he had somehow lost his boots. This is very strange, and reminiscent of the 411 cases if you guys are familiar. All I'm saying is if you guys find yourselves in Slovakia, it might be best to stay out of the woods. This experience has bothered me for many years, because I honestly don't know what to make of it. It has become one of those stories I tell around campfires. But this actually happened. And it still freaks me out when I think of it too much. I grew up on the east coast of Australia. And my family lived on a small country town on the edge of the rainforest. When I was 14, we rented a nice house on a few acres up a steep hill that ended in a cul de sac. The house was relatively nice. And sometimes I would go exploring the fire trails in the national forest behind us. I never found or saw anything weird. I don't even remember seeing any animals there either for some reason. Anyway, there was a deep, heavily forested gully with a small creek on the north side of the house that I never explored. Because one night when I was home by myself, I heard something really weird. It sounded like screaming. But it was a decent distance from our house. And it echoed through the gully. There were no other properties or houses between me and where the screaming seemed to be coming from. So I had no idea what was going on. It was eerie. I listened to it in the dark for a while. And then I decided to go inside and lock all the doors. I didn't tell anyone about this and probably would have forgotten about it if it hadn't reoccurred several years later. By the time I was 17, we had brought a property and built a house down in the valley across the creek, not very far from where we were renting a few years prior. It was a beautiful property that was skirted by a nice little creek with thick rainforest on three sides. I had kept up my habit of exploring the surrounding areas on foot. And in my 4WD, I knew it like the back of my hand. We had a large circular driveway that came down to the house wrapped around a large beech tree and connected back up with the road at the top of the property. The east side of the driveway had heavy bushland. And one night or early morning around 2am, I was coming home from my girlfriend's house and my parents had left the front porch light on for me. I would always round the driveway and park the car on the east side incline besides the bushland, as I was locking the door to the 4WD. Just as I removed the key from the door, I heard it again in the bushland, maybe 20 to 30 meters in front of me. But the bush was so thick, I couldn't have even seen a meter into the scrub. The light from the porch just lit up a dark wall of vegetation. 
It was in that moment I realized that every horrific scream I had heard prior to that moment in my life was not totally real. This one was different. It was real. And the difference chilled me to the bone. This person, it sounded like a woman, was being hurt brutally, and seemed as though their lungs would turn inside out from the agony. It sounded like they were trying to cry for help, but were in too much pain to make out any definite words. I stood there in shock for a moment, as I realized this scream was the same one I had heard years before, but this time closer. I went inside, and woke up my parents and we all stood on the front porch and listened for a few brief moments while we tried to decide what to do. My dad and I decided to investigate, and my mum called the police, who would have been useless anyway because we were so far out in the middle of nowhere. The screaming stopped, but we knew exactly where it was coming from. I grabbed a large cane knife, the best weapon I had in a country that outlaws firearms, and my father grabbed our spotlight. We got into the 4WD and drove around the bushland shining the spotlight in the area where we were sure the noise had been coming from. There was nothing. The police never came. But we drove around for about an hour thinking maybe the source of the noise could have moved. But the scrub in that area was so thick, they wouldn't have been able to move very fast except on the fire trails we were using and we covered those extensively in a short period of time on the 4WD. The next day, I fully expected there to be a news report of a grisly death in our area, which would have been very uncharacteristic of our lazy little town. I thought there was no way of whatever was making that noise would have been able to not leave a huge mess for someone to find, but there was nothing. I told a few people about this experience, but Australians are no-nonsense kind of people and don't put much stock in the supernatural. So everyone thought it was just wild pigs or an owl. I knew it wasn't either of those. My parents and I knew what we heard, and we were sure it was human. One person was convinced that it was koalas mating, and when I insisted that this noise was human, the person said, Oh yeah, that's what everyone who hears it thinks. So I thought that might be a possible explanation, but only for my own sanity. As far as I know, the noise was never heard again, and a few years later my parents and brother moved out of state, and I was living in the US for university and was sharing this experience with some kind of friends late one night, and the point that koalas mating was kind of a funny punchline. Except this time, one of my friends, who was obviously interested in the relations of marsupials, said, Have you ever looked up on YouTube to see if the sounds match up? I hadn't. So we spent a bit of time looking up videos of koalas mating. There were quite a few. And not one video sounded close to what we heard. So back to square one, with no explanation. Anyone have any idea what this could possibly be? I'm a 23-year-old fat girl from England. This is an important detail. I'm also 5'5", five five and was 19 at the time of this story. I used to walk my dog at night until this experience. Not the kind of dark where you can't see anything, but the kind where you can make out a fair bit, but not perfectly. This is what the area is like. Middle of nowhere everyone knows each other kind of village. Strangers or visitors are always spotted as they stand out, and a fair few of my neighbours walk late, and the neighbour I always meet while I'm out is usually this six foot three, heavily tattooed 46 year old man with two very unfriendly big dogs, one massive German Shepherd. We were great friends and still are. The only other dog his wouldn't attack was mine, so I had no worries about that late hour, because he was normally just a shout away. This night I bumped into him, just ending his walk, which had happened a few times. I'm around half hour into my 45 minute walk in the woods, earphones in, playing music, and just checking my phone for which song to play next. I notice my dog is looking up, as if he can see something. I assume it's another neighbour, fox or deer, 
My dog doesn't chase anything, so it was normal that he didn't run after any animal. I looked up calmly to see a strange man standing around, 20 to 25 feet away from me, holding a rifle. Now, remember, this is England. So having a gun, unless you're a farmer, let alone a rifle, is an extremely difficult task. He also didn't have a dog, and this isn't hunting season. He looked shocked, but angry to see me there. At this point, I remember my head torch, and he turns to look at me. He angles himself to face me, and at this point I knew I couldn't turn around or run since I'm very out of shape. More so then. So I carry on walking. As we go past, my dog gives him a wide berth, which is unusual since he's so friendly and loves literally everyone and everything. When I was level with him, he shuffled and just said, evening. I responded with the usual good evening and sped walked out of there. Looking back over my shoulder as I was about to leave the woods, I saw he hadn't moved, just stood there looking at me. I never walked home again at night. This freaked me out so much because it's never happened again. And any hunting near me has to be done in a certain area at a certain time of year. He could have been hunting, but I'm sure I would have heard a gun go off at some point since sound travels and I can hear bird scarers and other fields through my earphones. For context, I didn't walk with the neighbor a lot because he was inconsistent with times due to work, and it had been safe with no issues in this area before. Creepy guy, let's not meet again. I live in a very small town of about 100 people in rural New South Wales, Australia. This happened when my friends and I were 14. My town used to be a very close knit farming community. But the shift to modern times and the massive drought of the 2000s led to most of the businesses to be closed and farmers to move away. The aging population slowly died, and their houses were filled with despicable types, drug dealers and addicts, thieves and dull bludgers. It's sad really, but even now there are still great people here. What I've always found creepy is even though a very small population, and I've known just about everyone since before I can remember, there have always been people in the surrounding area that no one seems to know. Old loners mostly who keep to themselves, and no one ever sees them. On top of that, there have been several depraved people with interests in minors. There have also been numerous break-ins and attempted break-ins in our homes, not to mention that for long stretches of time, we've been without a police officer, which means a 000 call would take an hour for help to arrive. It gets even creepier. The further the bush you go, I've heard of abandoned farmsteads where families have just vanished, with all their belongings including their cars left behind. There was even a multi-generational inbred family reminiscent of the Hills Have Eyes discovered a few years ago, though that was a few hundred miles from me. I grew up and went to primary school here, but we had to travel an hour to get to high school. It took quite a while for my closest childhood friends, Tim and I, to make new friends. After two years of high school, we invited three friends to come out to town to go camping. Tim's parents owned a small property where they kept sheepdogs and horses a few miles from the town. We camped for five days there in the school holidays. The first night, as what often happens, we sat around the campfire telling stories. I told the story of some of those creepy loners I mentioned earlier, a pair of brothers that lived a few miles up the road from where we were camping. They were rarely ever seen, with a reputation of being creepy Hillbilly Hicks. I told them the story of how one night they had tried to cripple my father over him, supposedly stealing their business. They ambushed him at the local Weybridge at night. My father managed to fight both of them off, and my cousin also had a run in with them by taking a shortcut across their field, only to hear a firearm shot in his direction. My cousin had lied to me before, so I wasn't sure if it was true, 
but I made out like it was and later embellished their reputation with the normal inbred cannibal type crap city folk expect. On the second night, we decided to go for a night walk. We were kids and enjoyed fantasy movies and games and had a bit of role playing fun. One of us was too scared to go out in the dark. So on our walk, we decided to play a prank on him. We started screaming and running back to camp saying he got Henry. It worked. And our friend was scared. Zeb tried to climb an electric fence to escape. I Henry came back dirty and bloody. And we hid in a farmhouse until Tim ruined the prank by claiming he heard the brother skinned people, which caused us to burst out laughing. The next afternoon we hiked up the nearest hill called Sims Gap Hill. It was a popular walk for Tim and I when we were kids. The fastest way to get to the hill was by taking the dirt road called the stock route, which ran parallel to the main tar road which led to the town. The two roads are connected by another called sawmill road, which was at the base of the hill. We walked down the stock route. And I pointed out the hillbilly brothers property as we went past it. All you can see from the road are piles of rusted old cars. We reached sawmill road and walked across the paddock to the hill and had an enjoyable time. We started climbing down the hill as it got late, but underestimated the time it took to walk across the paddock to the road. By the time we reached the road, it was night. And of course, it happened to be pitch black. As we started walking down Sawmill Road to the stock route, a pair of massive bright headlights turned onto the road from behind us. Naturally, we got off the road, which meant disappearing into the thick patch of trees between the road and the brother's property. As the lights caught up to us, the vehicle started slowing. Up until then, we had thought it was a farmer's ute, but now we realized it was a very old, very loud tractor. Not wanting to be questioned, by any meddling adult, I tried to encourage the guys to hide. The tractor slowed right down and flashed a spotlight into the trees and then sped away. The guys asked me who it was and I said I didn't know. As we continued walking slowly, we saw the tractor turn around the stock route and then into the brother's property. Now I was unnerved. The tractor came roaring down the fence line and I yelled at the guys to run. We ran until we came to a small, well hidden ditch, which we jumped in and lay very still. The tractor stopped right on us and they shined the spotlight over the trees. It didn't illuminate the ditch, luckily. The driver stopped and got off the tractor, walked over to the fence, and I peered up and saw the silhouette of a dirty, disheveled man with messy hair standing at the fence line looking around. In his hands, was a rifle. In a nasally Aussie hillbilly voice, he yelled out, Where are you? We didn't dare move. I started thinking what we'd have to do if he climbed the fence and started coming our way. But he eventually turned around, got back on his tractor and left. It started with a groan and then rumbled down the other way. I got my friends up and we sprinted towards the stock route ducking under branches and jumping over fallen trees. We hadn't quite hit it when the headlights were behind us again, roaring up Sawmill Road. We made it to the road and panicked. It was still two or three miles back to the camp and we wouldn't be able to outrun the tractor. On the other side of the stock route was a state forest with tens of miles of twisting dirt roads and motorbike trails and goat tracks. Despite how dark it was, with the strong possibility of getting lost, we dove in there. We hid as he went past us again, finding a forest road which led back to the general direction of town. We followed it for a while, wondering if he had given up and if it was safe to go back on the stock route. Then he was in front of us, blinding headlights roaring down the forest road. We jumped back in the trees and decided to run. We ran straight past him. Behind us, he turned back on the stock route and chased us again. He circled us four times with us hiding, then running, then hiding, then running. When we had gone far enough, that we thought we were close enough to the camp, we ran through the woods and jumped back on the stock route to be met by headlights. 
Tim's mother had come looking for us after finding our camp empty. She'd finally found us and we were still a mile or so from camp. We quickly piled in and she drove us back. We told her what happened, but she and my parents just said they're weird people and to stay away from them in future. I went on a backpacking trip in some youth program in the Northern Cascades near Seattle. One of us got hurt by a falling rock on our way to base camp. So I had to help carry him back to the trailhead while accompanied by one of the leaders. On our way back, we came across another hiker, a young woman. We talked as we were all sort of taking a rest. And she said she was going to summit one of the peaks later on the trail. The thing is, the trailhead to the peak was about eight hours one way. And she had a light day pack. The next day back at base camp, helicopters swarmed and men were dropping. It was like a movie. I was taken aback. Little did we know it was a huge search and rescue team looking for the same woman I had interacted with not 16 hours before. For three days every night, all I could hear was the distant calls of the men calling her name, all echoing off the base and walls in an endless call for this person. I remember hearing it was a supposed way to end her own life, that she was a seasoned hiker. Yet she didn't pack anywhere near enough for this excursion. It didn't make sense. Perhaps she just wanted to get far enough, then stay. That would be her final moment. Atop a peak, doing something she absolutely loved. I remember after I flew home, I would not stop thinking about her. And I have never stopped. I still search her name, just to find she's never been found that she is not just without her family, but that she has seemingly disappeared into nothing. It bothers me thinking of what those hours right after we spoke were like for her. What she saw last, what her last thoughts were, what she did last, but it doesn't seem to matter. Because whatever any of those answers are, they will quite possibly never be found. Just like she never was. I cannot put into words how much this haunts me to this day. I was living in Australia for a year. I was once a passenger carrier traveling through towns to get to the next destination. We were passing through rural towns in New South Wales that are small but still well populated. We pass by a field slash park where families are having picnics, enjoying the day, kids running around and playing. While I'm looking at the park and all the people in it with my head on the window, I all of a sudden see what looks like a gray zombie walking through it. It's walking right by families and people sitting down, but no one seems to take notice of this thing that's sticking out like a sore thumb. No one is looking up at what I assume is a freak in a Halloween costume when it's not Halloween. It's moving slowly and limping like a zombie would, but has a dead look in its eyes and its skin is gray. If my memory serves me correctly, even its clothes are gray. It's wearing tattered clothes and has a Frankenstein monster kind of air about it. That's the best way I can describe it. Like a gray zombie Frankenstein monster. My eyes follow it the entire time while my bus passes the park, which is only for a moment. But the thing that freaks me out the most is how it's passing by all these families and no one is paying any attention to it. The thing is, it didn't necessarily seem evil to me, just sad. It didn't make eye contact with me. It was just walking slowly and sadly through the park. This huge gray guy is dressed up as Frankenstein's monster painted gray on this sunny day, and no one even took notice of him. I don't know what to make of it. A very short 10 second psychosis on my part, or something supernatural. I also wanted to share this with you to see if any other Aussies know any legends that resemble what I saw, or if anyone has had a similar experience because I can't explain this strange humanoid 
and can't find anything similar regarding this encounter. In spring of 2015, I at barely 18 years old, took five of my friends, all girls, to what is known as Bunny Man's Bridge in Fairfax. You may be wondering what is Bunny Man's Bridge, and I'm going to enlighten you. The story goes that in 1904, there was an asylum not too far from this bridge. The residents nearby didn't like the idea of mental patients living nearby. So they protested and got it shut down. And all the patients were taken by bus to Lawton Prison. The bus swerved and crashed. They were able to locate all inmates bar one. The escaped mental patient's name was Douglas Griffin. After the crash, he vanished. Weeks passed and rabbit corpses began appearing in the woods. Douglas was apparently eating bunnies to stay alive. And this went on for a while. Then one Halloween night, a group of kids were hanging around the bridge. And they reported seeing something strange. And then in a flash, they had all been strung up like the bunnies gutted and hanging from the bridge. The missing mental patient was of course, assumed to be the one responsible. And the rumor goes that if you come here on Halloween night at midnight, you will end up just like those poor children. That is the urban legend. It was a Monday maybe 9pm when we showed up. And I wanted to get out and climb up and walk along the railroad tracks that run over the bridge, as I had done that plenty of times in the past. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and sat for a minute telling them the tale of the bunny man, at which point they kind of got freaked out and decided to stay in the car. We sat there and kept talking for five minutes until someone in the back seat gasped and froze staring out the back window on my side of the car. I turned to my right to look at her and saw everyone else's faces freeze in horror. And the girl right behind me yelped as I realized what was happening. I turned my head the other way to see who must be approaching when someone started pounding on the back window and continued as they moved up towards my door. I turned just in time to see a man with a huge white dog come up and rip my door open as it was still unlocked from before when I was planning to get out. And for a second, he just stood there and stared at me. He was visibly enraged. He started telling me this was private property and that we were trespassing. And before I had a chance to tell him we'd leave, he started yelling at me to get out of the car. I was like, No, we're just gonna leave. At that point, he loses his mind, starts yelling in my ear. And I think he saw my keys sitting on my lap, because he tried to grab them. But I pushed his arm away and started yelling profanities while my friends in the passenger seat gasped loudly. He stepped back for a second, and looked up and down, and then started eyeing the big metal cop flashlight I keep under my seat and tried to grab that too. But fortunately, his dog was off doing his own thing. It was actually a cute dog that seemed rather friendly. And the leash pulled his arm away long enough for me to grab the door handle. He caught it just before it shut and was trying to force it back open saying he was going to call the police. And I think I said, likewise, and finally thought to grab my keys with my free hand and start the car. I drove off while he was still holding the handle, and then closed it once he couldn't keep up and had to let go. I watched him in the mirror as he sped away. And it really freaked me out that he'd let go of the leash and began sprinting after us until he knew he couldn't catch us up. At which point, he just let out a deep primal scream just as we passed under the bridge. It looked like 
He was bending down to pick something up, maybe a rock, but we cleared the corner before he could throw anything. I told my dad about it when I got home and he made me call the police to report it. And the woman at the station actually sounded pretty concerned, which is something I wasn't expecting. After that, I read up all these stories about the legendary bunny man, and lots of them described a crazy man yelling about trespassing and stuff, which was already enough to freak me out. But what's really wild is the guy could kind of match up with some of the descriptions given in the other reports, although they all sounded like pretty generic white guy descriptions, so it shouldn't have been that shocking. What made it so confusing was that he didn't look crazy or dangerous. He was maybe five foot 10, white, mid fifties, looking quite fit and healthy, and was wearing a flannel shirt, jeans and a baseball cap. Aside from the psycho behavior, he actually might have been kind of hot. Also, the dog threw me off because of how totally friendly and docile it seemed. I still can't figure out where he would have walked up from. I'd been checking my mirrors and peripherals the whole time we were parked there, up to the moment of the first girl gasped. All I can think of was that he must have walked straight out of this bamboo forest that's on the right as you come out of the other side of the narrow tunnel, running through under the bridge. We turned around and were facing the bridge from the other side. So this bamboo was on our left and the whole rest of the immediate area is so thickly forested, aside from a long wide concrete driveway to our right just in front of us. I never heard back from the police about it. I've gone back there a few times since it happened, but I won't ever park and sit around again. I just drive friends through the bridge who haven't seen it before and then turn around and leave. All in all, it made for a pretty fitting campfire story but I still wonder what he would have done if I'd stepped out the car, or he'd have gotten a hold of the nightstick flashlight. The only logical explanation is that he's a resident sick of kids playing down there, which I get, but to say he overreacted is an understatement, not to mention he completely fed into the law of the crazy man yelling at trespassers. I can only think of a handful of times I've ever seen someone so overcome with fury, especially over something so trivial. It was so unreal when he first started yelling. I wondered if he was maybe just a normal level of upset, but also socially maladroit or maybe mentally challenged until he tried to grab at my keys. That is flying off the handle. There's no moral to this story. Maybe carry some sort of protection in future. But in any case, bunny man, or whoever you are, let's not meet again. This happened to me about 10 years ago, and stays with me vividly as one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. And I don't usually believe in paranormal things. Our family were renovating a very old house in rural Australia, over 100 years old, which we were about halfway through the renovation. We were staying in another small outhouse while doing the renovation, but we had family and friends coming to stay with us. So I had to forfeit my normal bedroom and stay in the main house in a tent as it was nowhere near ready to sleep in. Most of the nights, I woke around 3am to our working dogs about 200 meters away from the house, going absolutely nuts barking at something but I usually didn't pay much attention to them, as kangaroos often jump near their kennels and set them off some nights. As their barking came to a stop, I could faintly hear crisp and clear footsteps out the room I was in and down the hallway getting louder and clearly slower, making their way towards my room. I didn't think much of it at first, but the direction the noise was coming from was so clear. The footsteps slowly made their way up to the room and hallway and stopped, at what I thought to be the doorway of the room. I was locked up with fear of what the hell was standing in the doorway and trying to figure out what I could do. And then it started moving again, only this time straight towards my tent and stopped right next to it. And I was waiting for the tent to start shaking, but it only stopped for a brief second and then walked into the corner of the room and stopped. 
The fear I felt at that moment kept me paralyzed for what felt like hours. I was sweating and had a blanket over me and was too afraid to move. After a while, I eventually calmed down enough to get my light I had with me, open the zippers of the tent, and look out to which I found nothing in the room. So I climbed back into the tent and somehow managed to get back to sleep, as I never heard anything more. In the morning, I woke up fairly early and went back over to the little outhouse and tell my parents my story and ask them if they were just messing with me, but they were adamant they didn't do anything. To add to the strange noise of the footsteps, there were loose floorboards all over the hallway floor, drying out, spaced tightly together, getting ready to be put down in the coming weeks. So I decided to try and replicate those footstep noises but couldn't, as the boards on the floor would move and make completely different sounds. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was just my head playing tricks on me, or if there was something strange going on in that house. When I was a kid, reading was one of my most treasured pastimes. For years, I used to go to the Huntington County Public Library about once a week and check out as many books as allowed. I can still remember how hard it was to choose which books to pick. Most of the time, the selected titles I ended up with centered around my favorite subjects, ghost stories, mysteries, and more than anything else, creatures from ancient mythologies from all over the world. All sorts of creatures, good and bad, filled the pages of the books. I can still remember turning those pages like it were yesterday. Among the most intriguing creatures to my younger self was of course, the goat man. In one of the main books that I borrowed from the library 57 times during the mid 1990s was a book with a title that escapes me despite reading it dozens of times. Eventually, I created my own versions of these stories and would practice orally reciting them to my younger brother and sister, Colt and Sierra. The goat man was one of our absolute favorites. From time to time when we were kids, we would load up the minivan and go for a drive out in the country as a family. If you're not familiar with rural Indiana, which is where we grew up, it's made up for the most part by a bunch of cornfields, soybean fields, and patches of forested areas. That said, there were also thousands of crossroads laid out like a checkerboard all across the state. Each of the intersections leading off into the four cardinal directions, and eventually to another small or medium sized town. That is to be fair, partially how Indiana became known as the crossroads of America, after all. These patches of forest range anywhere from a couple of acres to several hundreds of acres. Naturally, as we cruised these back roads or country roads as we called them, the forests of the surrounding area became the home of the goat man in our hearts and minds. I will never forget sitting in the back seat of that maroon colored Dodge caravan and whispering to Colt and Sierra my newest version of the goat man, vampire, or Dracula stories. The first story I recall reading about the goat man in particular was a watered down version of the Dr. Stephen Fletcher experiment version of the story. In the original version, a mentally unstable patient escapes a government lab outside of the capital of the United States in the state of Maryland. A victim to the sadistic and abusive DNA based experiments, the patient became insane as he transformed into a full blown half goat half man. Enraged at what had become of his former self, the goat man sabotaged the lab and escaped into the wilderness where he still roams to this day, or so they say. In the earliest versions of the goat man stories that I read, it was something very similar to the above example. However, it wasn't exactly a DNA test that went wrong scenario, rather a top secret lab located somewhere in the depths of the forest, where they originally did these experiments on animals. 
The program was successful, up until the point that the chief scientist was turned into half goat, half man, when something went terribly wrong, and an explosion occurred due to an equipment malfunction in the lab. The scientist, like in the other stories, retreated into the woods with a disdain for humanity. And yes, you guessed it. He still resides in those woods to this very day. In my personal version of the story, the plot line was something in between the two. Each time I would tell my brother and sister some new little details that would be added in and repeated the next time. In that manner, the story basically evolved at each time it was told. For this reason, I highly doubt that Colt or Sierra will ever believe what I experienced in 2016 onwards. However, that will not keep me from sharing the story. During my trip to Mammoth Caves, Kentucky, I encountered none other than the Goat Man. Not once either, but twice. For those of you who aren't familiar with the mythological creature, the Goat Man stories go back centuries, from mythology and legends of old pagan folklore and superstitions. The Goat Man has been around for nearly as long as written history. If you know anything about the Goat Man, you'll be aware that he basically appears the same as a fawn or satyr. Satyrs come from Greek mythology, and they're more or less male nature spirits. They have the same basic shape as a man, but with the legs of a goat or horse, and apparently sometimes can have human-like legs as well. However, they always have a tail, which is similar to a horse. Satyrs and fawns also have horns on the top of their head, as well as being known to have an exaggeratedly large member. I suppose you could say they appear somewhat devilish by all means. They're known to dwell within forest, woodlands, marshes, mountains, and in other wild places far from human civilization. Aside from being similar to fawns and satyrs, the goat man has been known by many other names over the centuries, and perhaps even longer. As far as the goat man being spotted in Kentucky, the oldest reports I've ever heard of date back as far as the mid 1700s. And truth be told even further, if you take into account Native American folklore and oral history passed down from tribe to tribe, and then to the settlers. These Native American tales include similar creatures to the Goatman, Dogman and Bigfoot. According to these indigenous tribes, the creatures were said to have lived in the area centuries longer than their own people had. They told stories of these beings living alongside the giants and other strange, magical, and terrifying creatures from ages ago. In Northern Kentucky, just as with Southern Indiana and Western Ohio, supposedly the beasts devoured and ate some of the livestock and generally horrified these families until they were forced to abandon their homesteads in the wilderness of the early American territories. More than one recorded account as such, occurred in and around the Jefferson County area of Kentucky in the 1800s. In modern media, such sightings have been reported in Kentucky since the 1940s, specifically in Jefferson County. Today, parts of Kentucky, specifically the areas known to the locals as Kentuckyania, as well as good old Jefferson County, are some of the goat man's main stomping grounds. One area in particular on the eastern side is home to what has been known as the infamous Jefferson County Goatman Trestle. Apparently sightings of Goatman-like beings have occurred there and around the trestle for decades according to locals. I know this firsthand as I've lived in the Fort Knox area on and off for a handful of years. Anyway. The railroad trestle is more well known for incidents associated with the goat man, as recently as 2016. She and her boyfriend were hiking the trestle in search of the legendary creature, when an oncoming train appeared on the track, and it was too soon for her to get to safety. The young man was able to hang onto the tracks until the train passed, but barely. It was a mess and a real tragedy. Even more, it furthered the local legend that the goat man and his presence are near those tracks. In any case, 
my own encounter with the goat man, which I was not looking for or expecting, occurred approximately one and a half hours south, and slightly to the east of Jefferson County, Kentucky. If you've ever been to Kentucky, or any of the Appalachian states, you'll be fully aware of just how much nature there is out there. Millions of acres. That said, the fact that my encounter with the mystical being was at least 75 miles away from Jefferson County, and their long standing history of goatman sightings, makes me question whether it's an entire species out there similar to Bigfoot. However, on the other hand, a deity like being such as Pan would make short walks of a 75 mile distance, believe me. In other words, if you believe that being that I encountered south of Jefferson County could have been the same as the one sighted in Kentucky over 300 years ago. Back in the summer of 2016, I did quite a bit of hiking and camping in the state of Kentucky. During the time I visited at least a dozen protected areas, including parks, forests, and nature preserves. One of the central locations that I frequented was my favorite national park and famous UNESCO World Heritage Site, Mammoth Caves. It's supposedly one of the most significant cavern systems in the world. In fact, there are rumors that the cave leads directly to the center of the earth, and depending on who you talk to, to an inner earth civilization of lizard people, or else to hell itself. I chose this particular spot because I'd heard it was supposed to have a lot of caves off the trail. Years prior to 2016, I was told by a relative that they found an entrance in one of the main caverns in this particular forest. So it was my full intention to discover at least one of the alleged back doors to the cave system. That however, is not what ended up happening at all. I did make several discoveries over the summer, including what I believe to be an unmarked Native American site, and several primitive hand tools. I also found a species of mushroom used by a priest and shaman of indigenous cultures of the past, which according to the number one and number two mushroom identification guides in the world, most of these specific species of mushrooms supposedly don't exist in the area. My first visit to Mammoth Caves National Park occurred in May of 2016. At the time, I was backcountry hiking and camping for the most part, as it was on my first trip to this forest in particular. I was unaware of the unusual park regulations and so set up my camp in the same manner I do in most national and state forests that I'm exploring. I find a lonely section of trail first, find the most suitable spot for pitching a tent, at least 100 yards away from the path, and make sure my campsite is about 300 yards or further from the nearest fresh water source like streams or rivers. And later I would find out that backcountry campers are only allowed to camp overnight in the park's pre-designated camping sites. These sites are set between a mile or two or three down any given trail, as I mentioned. However, I was unaware of these stipulations for backcountry campers on my first trip. So I was illegally camping more or less. The trail I selected for my first trip to the back was in actuality a well used horseback riding trail. Over the years hiking and camping and such in national forests, I have found that horseback riding trails are often more challenging, as well as being incredibly scenic in comparison to many of the normal footpaths. That said, I followed this particular trail around a mile or so before jumping off and searching the forest for a suitable spot to camp. Eventually I came across a stream and followed it long enough until where it emptied into a larger creek. I then traveled down until I spotted the trail again. After scouting around for a while and getting a better feel for the area, I returned to the creek and explored it until I found an area with several waterfalls. And then I broke out a camp in the surrounding wilderness. I believe that the first trip I made to Mammoth Caves National Park lasted around five days. It was pretty uneventful compared to later trips. However, it was more than fascinating to me due to the handful of discoveries I made. 
the most intriguing development was finding what I believe was a legitimate Native American holy site. However, being somewhat more familiar with the indigenous legends of the area, it could have easily just been an ancient hunting camp as well. The particular site I'm referring to was maybe half a mile upstream from my campsite. The campsite itself was extremely well hidden, meaning you couldn't see it from 30 yards away, let alone from the nearest park trail, which was at least a third of a mile away. The potential Native American site that I found was even better hidden. In fact, if I had discovered it sooner, I would have more than likely made it my campsite, as it would have been absolutely perfect. The site was located between a couple of ridges which were several hundred feet high, and well away from any trails. The stream that flows beside the site shows up on all maps as a dry branch of a local creek. I also found several spots on the creek bottom that were quite visible stone tool markings. Shortly after returning home from this particular trip, and doing some research on the things I'd come across in the area, I realized I'd been camping illegally the whole time. This in turn led me to very carefully study the map of the National Forest and its backcountry camping sites, trails and water sources before returning for a second trip a few months later. The next time that I went to Mammoth Caves National Park, I chose a trail, a backcountry camping site that was absolutely isolated in comparison to other areas within the park. There was nothing else around at all. In fact, I was particularly intrigued with this trail because it was clearly separated from the rest of the park, including the entire trail system itself. Being the sort of place I enjoy to explore, I decided to go check it out. The trail itself is around two miles long, which isn't exactly long to be honest. However, the trail is completely isolated within the park system. And so I wanted to find out what it was about. After a short hike from the trailhead, I stopped for a rest and began to realize how uncomfortable I'd gradually started feeling over the first 45 minutes or so of the hike. My hiking partner at the time, Blue, mentioned feeling the exact same way without me ever saying as much first. We took a short rest before we grabbed our packs and carried on. The strange feeling of uncomfortableness as well as being watched didn't stop there, quite the contrary. The feelings grew as time marched on. A couple of hours later, we made it to the end of the trail and finally came to the muddy waves of the Green River, which is brown, not green. The designated camping spot created by the National Park Service wasn't much other than a mostly flat patch of dirt with an iron grate for having a cooking fire. In all honesty, we were quite disappointed. After a day at this campsite, I decided it was best to move camp slightly into the woods on the same day that we moved camp. And I realized that our water supply was dwindling down and that tainted muddy green river was not suitable for drinking even after purifying. And believe me, I used tablets and triple filtered it with a cloth and mesh and it still wasn't worth drinking. So I did the only thing that I could given the situation and went out in search of alternate drinking sources. For the better part of the afternoon, I spent a great deal of time searching the woods high and low for streams or creeks that might empty into a nearby river or even a stone pool of water. The first day I went looking for water and after having no luck, I returned to our hillside campsite, which was overlooking the designated backcountry site we were technically supposed to be camping in. What I found was Blue highly distraught and somewhat freaking out. When I questioned Blue about what happened, her response was that I probably wouldn't believe her even if she told me. She seemed tickled, but at the same time in disbelief and somewhat put out. I found her answer pretty disturbing initially. It was no secret I'm very open-minded as well as very experienced in many things paranormal. Eventually, after some amount of coaxing, she finally agreed to tell me exactly what had disturbed her so much while I was away. According to Blue, while I was searching for water, she had gone out doing her day piddling around the forest near the camp, 
in search of medicinal flowers and herbs, and just generally enjoying herself. It was during these actions that she felt as if there were eyes on her the entire time. And apparently only a short time before I returned to camp myself, Blue had settled back into camp, and the feeling of something watching her had been so strong that she couldn't stop herself from turning around and glancing up at the trail. What she claims to have seen was in her own words, a deer the size of a horse, and it was radiating golden rays of sun, as if light were contained inside its body. At the time, I didn't know what to think. Blue and I were good enough friends. We'd known each other for a handful of years, and had no tendency to be dishonest or exaggerate between us. That said, I honestly wanted to believe what she was telling me. But I just didn't know that I could. I mean, come on, a glowing deer the size of a horse? To most people, it would be laughable to even consider that she'd be telling the truth. Regardless, I tried to believe my friend wouldn't be making something like this up, for attention or otherwise. Later, after returning home from this particular trip, I would perform research that would eventually raise my level of awareness concerning how many other people have cited something similar. Even more, spotted in this exact part of the state, I found out that as far back as the 1700s, settlers reported seeing something similar while writing letters to family and friends in their journal entries. Basically, my research, which you can duplicate by spending a few hours googling the keyword Goatman, Jefferson County, Kentucky, and giant glowing deer, yielded me far more than enough results to accept Blue's word as truth. And honestly, it felt good to know that she'd not lied to me. That said, the giant glowing deer appeared to Blue, and was not the pinnacle of excitement for that particular trip not even by a long shot. However, the most frightening experience that we had that entire summer was very soon to happen. And believe me, it changed my life as well as how I view the forests and wild places of North America. As I mentioned earlier, I was out trying to get water. It was actually the first time I'd ever found myself in such a situation. I would usually make sure to pack a ridiculous amount of food and water if I was going to be camping somewhere for more than a few days. However, this time, based on the map and amount of water sources found on the last trip, I made to the same national park, I foolishly believed that the three documented streams, including a major river in the area, would provide more than enough water. That said, we packed enough water and food to last us the amount of time we thought we'd be there. That being said, each time I left the camp seeking out water, I returned to Blue only for her to have another strange experience to share with me each time. While I was away, there seemed to be no end of tracks that would appear near and around our camp. They included extremely large canine prints, cloven hoof prints that I mistook at the time for elk. I recognized that they weren't deer tracks, and thought that they were bigger than deer, maybe elk. and there appeared to be bare footprints that could have only been made by a woman or child due to size. They would always appear when I was away, and they did appear, and they were circling the general area. I might have written it off as busy foot traffic for local hikers, due to the river and the narrow trail. However, the prints were much stranger, due to the fact that we never heard or saw any other people. And furthermore, we most certainly never heard any dogs running around or barking either. So I can only speak for myself, but these footprints, dog tracks and goat tracks, to consistently show up around our camp day after day was beyond strange to me. I really wasn't sure what to think at the time. All I knew is that it was far from normal and something wasn't quite right. I was never able to shake the feeling that something was watching me. Speaking of which, the entire time I was scouting around these hills, ridges, woods, and river's edge, I felt as though I was being stalked by a predator. I stopped, suddenly twirling and crouching, scanning the trees, but I never did catch sight of anything. By the fifth day, I had searched the deepest trails of forest and hadn't come up with any more than a few mouthfuls of water. 
To make matters worse, we had no water left at this point. So we packed a day bag with supplies, mainly empty water containers, and went on one final quest to find enough water to last more than a few days in the wild. Hiking down the trail, I navigated us to one of the low water supply spots I'd managed to track down, even remotely close to the camp, which was about a mile or so. However, the pool was stagnant and looked extremely unhealthy. So we filtered a bit of water from the upper end of the stream far from the pool where the water was clear and flowing over rocks and grass and filled it up. I'd been collecting water from this source for a few days, just enough for us to stay hydrated. The problem was it hadn't rained in quite a while. So every time that source of water shrank drastically, and I knew that the water would be gone by the end of the day. We must have trekked around 15 miles in search for suitable water sources that day. And eventually, we found a couple of dry creek beds, which I'm a complete sucker for. And we ended up following this route for well over a mile, perhaps two. The thin stream of water was gathering in a stone basin, which was conveniently shaped and positioned perfectly as a drinking bowl. After drinking our fill, as well as refilling our water bottles, we headed back towards our camp, discussing the situation. At this point, five days in a row, there was no way we could sustain for two more days, let alone three or four, without digging water taps or wading out in waist deep mud of the riverbank. I'd already tried the riverbank more than once, and successfully, however, it was extremely dangerous. Earlier that week, I believe on the third day after searching for water unsuccessfully, I'd lost one of my shoes in the quicksand shore. It happened when my legs had been sucked out from underneath me, and I was trapped in the mud down over my knees on both legs. This caused a moment of pure panic for me. However, thankfully, I had the sense to instantly stop moving. As soon as the mud had grabbed a hold of me, I remember that absolutely any physical struggling in a situation like this was a sure way to make things much worse and possibly even be fatal. That said, I made my way out of the mud before the river got me, all being swallowed by the several meter wide shoreline itself. As a side note, I remember finding a shirt, a flip flop, and a machete less than 10 meters away from that very spot where I was sucked into the high mud. At the time, I didn't think much of the gear, other than it was odd to find one flip flop and not two, as well as a perfectly good machete being left behind. Other than that, the stuff was so close to the designated backcountry camping site that it wasn't out of the ordinary to find some gear left behind from travelers past. We decided that the best course of action would be to call for an extraction instead of toughing it with no water. Neither of us wanted to dig for water, and we weren't willing to risk the muddy river water either. So after powering on our phone and hiking to the nearest hilltop in order to get good signal service, we made the phone call to our ride, which is located two hours away. Knowing that our ride was on its way, and that we were still needing to return to camp, break everything down and pack our gear, adhere to leave no trace rule, and make the hike back to the trailhead, where our ride would be waiting for us, in approximately two hours. We were suddenly in a major rush. I mean, we were actually running on and off, as well as jogging for the most part our way back down the trail. There we were hauling ass down the trail in complete darkness on the loneliest trail in the entire national park. And we were determined to rendezvous with our ride as quickly as possible. When I noticed a booby trap, I pointed it out to Blue, making sure she saw it and didn't trip as she was in front of me. At that moment, we both felt extremely uncomfortable, confused, and quite honestly, scared. My first thought is that we'd been way too loud hiking around earlier, and we'd maybe attracted some unwanted attention when we'd ventured out onto the nearby country road in search for water earlier. I've been through and even lived in some of these little mountain towns, and believe me, I've heard some disturbing stories about human hunters. Of course, my second thought is that we've got some human hunters out in the woods probably watching us, just waiting for us to trip so that they can take us and do whatever it is that those crazy people do. I was extremely cautious and started slipping into survival mode mentally. 
I turned my headlamp off and let Blue continue leading the way forwards and down the path and began allowing my eyes to adjust to the darkness. I remember thinking to myself that I knew how to hunt as I gripped my machete's handle with one hand. Our pace fastened as we passed many other traps on the trail. Blue was in front and I was picking up at the rear. That's how I was able to react in time when she didn't notice the final one. The log set down just two or three inches from the dirt and stone trail. It caught her ankle, causing her to begin tumbling forwards. Seeing her pitch towards the darkness like that, and still paranoid about the people who might live here up to no good, I shot my arm out and grabbed her backpack to keep her from face planting into the trail and becoming an easy target. I had been gauging the situation and we quickly stomped our way through the darkness, down the trail, to our waiting ride. In that split second where I grabbed her bag, I didn't hear anything, not a single sound, but there was something that I did see. Those were legs, just for a split second. I'm sure it's impossible for something to jump into the air like that, and not land somewhere to make any sort of noise. Despite being terrified and rattled to my core, I didn't tell Blue what I saw. What I did tell her was something like, hurry the hell up. After seeing those legs, my thoughts were that it was still following us, and that whatever it was had been standing by the edge of the path directly beside me in the shadows, watching. I can't describe the fear that was overtaking me in that moment. A fire had apparently been started within a stone circle, yet on the other side of the trail, and had obviously been put out very recently. The chunks of wood were barely burned, though charred utterly black, as were the stones. In all honesty, it looked like someone had gathered stones from the nearby forest, built a fire on the side of the trail, as if by dousing a bunch of wood in lighter fluid, tossing a match on it, and then after everything was nicely charred, dousing it all in water. This may not sound strange to those who hike, but fires on trails are absolutely illegal. What was more intriguing than the stone fire circle was the dog's leash that was tied to the tree on the other side of the trail, an enormous pile of dog food at the base of the same particular tree. It looked like someone took a 20 pound bag of dog food and dumped it upside down there. Later, I would question those things much more, as well as what they meant, possibly even more than what I questioned, the existence of this strange half stag, half goat human being out there. I couldn't help but wonder if it had been someone in the woods with us, possibly someone who meant to harm us, or if it was the creature, or perhaps if it intervened. I couldn't help but wonder if this thing was playing games and covering its own tracks and intentions with purposeful layers of deception. The most frustrating part is that I'll never know exactly what happened that night. The hour and a half drive back home was more than quiet. All you could hear were the tires rolling down the road and the sounds of each other's breathing. I think everyone in the vehicle could tell that something had happened in the woods. It was late at night, we were exhausted and confused as to what exactly had gone down. Over the next several months, I would research the area and everything remotely related to what we had experienced. I would pore over reports of similar sightings in the region, finding some dating back more than two centuries, ultimately only to find out its history. After a whole load of research, to my utmost surprise, this particular region of the state, let alone country, has a very colorful history concerning creature sightings. For example, it is especially known as being the home for the famous cryptids like Bigfoot and Dogman. It's also well known for Goatman sightings and many other types of rare cryptids and elusive birds, funnily enough. That's when I decided that I needed to go back. There were even some accounts going back as the 1700s, not to mention Native American accounts of once human sorcerers who traded their last shreds of humanity completed wicking deeds in exchange for wonderful abilities. These beings, as you may be aware, are known as skimwalkers. 
I immediately began planning a trip back to the exact same area of the National Forest where I'd initially sighted the creature. So after packing up enough supplies to last me a few days, including my ultralight 9mm Taurus with hollow point rounds, and headed back to Mammoth Caves once again. This time, however, I wasn't going to be walking into the supernatural or a literal bunch of booby traps. I was prepared as I was ever going to be. It was early March and freezing cold outside, so much so that I had two or three pairs of pants on, the same with shirts, face masks, and heavy winter gloves. And then, without fear of judgment or giving a damn of who might pass me by, I began seeking out into the woods and speaking to them, directly trying to communicate with the creature itself. I assumed that it was watching there as I listened. I asked if it remembered me from last time and why it had set traps in the trail for me and my buddy. I asked why it had let me see its legs. I wasn't sure if it was its intention or not. At this point, I don't think it was. So in this manner, walking and talking, I hiked down on the trail for another mile or so. Eventually, I reached the campsite I'd set out for. As soon as I did, I set up my tent and pulled out the rocket stove that I'd made specifically for this trip. I had my stove fired up in no time and was warming not only my hands, but percolating my cup of coffee and heating a can of soup as well. The rocket stove was actually nothing more than a giant coffee can with a circle cut out the side and another can placed neatly inside of it with a matching hole cut in it. In addition, a third even smaller can with its top and bottom parts removed was placed into said circles. This last can was the central opening to the stove, where you would feed it twigs, grass and wood chip. The gap between the large coffee can and can inside of it, as both cans make up the main portion of the stove, was filled with dirt, rocks and sand. I planned on digging a deep hole and burying the thing when I was done with it. The reason I had decided to build this thing in the first place was because I didn't want campfire with flames dancing around and splashing light all over the forest once the sun was down and it became dark. I know what you're thinking. I purposefully hiked out into a secluded camping spot. Yes, I was alone. And yes, I wanted it to be dark as possible because I wanted whatever it was that was out there to at least approach the camp. The noise was coming from the darkness of the forest, just out of eyesight due to the falling light. At first, I thought it could have been a deer running through the forest. However, being a woodsman, I know that deers aren't known for running around humans in circles. I wrote deer off my list of possibilities really quick. While I sat there, my brain was racing with all kinds of jumbled up thoughts. The noises got even louder as they approached the backside of my camp. And for a split second, the sound stopped as soon as I realized it was due to the fact that whatever it was had jumped over the giant log that lined one side of the campsite. The thing landed with a loud thud a dozen or so yards from my tent, which was far too close for comfort. Large game like deer or elk and moose are known to make sounds like this. It's this horse exhaling through the nostrils. In addition to the sound of hooves stomping and scuffing the ground near my tent, it also filled my ears. Due to the sudden turn of events, I pulled my weapon out, causing a hollow point 9mm round of ammunition to slide into the chamber. I lay there breathing heavily, heart beating in my ears, clutching my pistol to my chest, straining to hear each little noise I could plainly hear. I could still make out the stomping between my tent and the enormous log I had pitched near it. It stalked back and forth a few times, snorting and scuffing up the earth as it went. Finally, after what seemed like forever, the noises stopped. I waited, finger literally on the trigger, but hearing nothing else, I decided the creature must have retreated back to the forest. And after a few more minutes of total silence, I slowly released the magazine from my handgun removed the live round from the chamber and re-added it to the mag before slipping it back into the pistol. 
removing the live ammo and re-engaging the safety mechanism of the pistol took about two seconds, which I'm reasonably sure it or anyone else could have heard from outside the tent. That said, I added the bullets back into the top of the magazine with my thumb, put the safety on and set it down. No sooner had I finished togging the pistol's safety mechanism back on, setting it inside the flap of my bag and laying down in my sleeping bag, did something land directly beside my tent, and I mean directly next to it. It was practically standing on the side of the wall nearest my head. I felt the ground shake and heard it come down with a clear, audible thump all at once. Also, to be 100% real, I almost soiled my pants as well. What happened next still gives me chills to this day. As I lay there paralyzed with fear, something suddenly poked into the material on the side of my tent and slowly dragged itself all the way across from one side to the other. The material of the tent was pushed in as if by a finger or tree branch, perhaps even the tip of a horn. Whatever it was that moved it, was in such a smooth and wavy sort of motion, it put me in the mind of some deranged lunatic or killer walking around and pushing it with the tip of its finger and grinning maniacally up at the sky, just knowing the terror he must instill in his victims. Inside the tent, laying there with less than a tenth of an inch or however thick the material was, I was in total disbelief and could not believe what was happening to me. It seemed that who or whatever had been loitering at the edge of my camp had purposefully waited to approach me until I retreated into the tent, and then once they did approach, waited until my firearm was on safety and put away. I don't believe in coincidence, and it still doesn't. The facts are that at any moment my gun was put up, was the moment that thing jumped over my tent. It could have done it at any time, but it didn't. It chose to wait until it heard the weapon being unloaded and stored away. Only then did it get close enough to my tent. Did it leave me no more room for guessing? Now I knew for sure that it had not merely been tricks of the imagination earlier in the summer, when I had seen those massive goat legs disappear into the dark. Everything I had witnessed up until this point had become very real very quickly. The hoofs, the legs, the prancing around my camp in the shadows, all of it and so much more. I don't recall much else about that night. In all honesty, to the best of my knowledge, nothing else happened. I lay there, completely frozen in fear, until I fell asleep. Nothing else eventful happened for the rest of the trip. Next morning, I had coffee, calmly packed my gear up and headed back down the trail towards the trailhead. Part of me was deeply satisfied with the extraordinary experience I had on that trip. However, an even more significant part of me was far from happy. I was left with zero doubt that the goat man was real, and now that I had indeed seen him, more questions than ever before were swimming and formulating in my mind. I got home and after a hot meal and shower and rest, I began searching the area quite extensively. It was practically an obsession for a short period of time. I poured over everything I could access via the internet and even considered visiting some local libraries, but opted to skip the latter due to my uncomfortableness speaking with the others about the incident at the time. So on my internet-based crusade, I soon found out some pretty interesting facts that made me even more curious. Among the more interesting data I came across was the fact that the specific tract of forest that now belongs to the National Park had been dubbed Goblin Knob by the locals a couple of centuries ago. In other words, the wooded area that I'd witnessed the half man, half stag being. As you can imagine, when I came across this quirky little fact about the area, I couldn't help but wonder to myself if this creature or being had something to do with the name the locals had given it. I wonder if it had something to do with why the National Park Service had decided to run a single trail through the area and left out any pavilions, picnicking areas, campgrounds or restrooms. Basically, there's nothing in this area except an old chimney place and a single backcountry campsite, if you can even call it that. We were a group of four, my girlfriend, two friends and me. We had a fun evening at home while drinking and playing video games. Because we all had the next day off, 
We didn't really care about time. And at 1am, my friend told me that they were taking the train home. Me and my girlfriend went with them to the train station. And then we saw that they had missed the last train. So we decided to walk with them home, which is a roughly six kilometer journey. This is all through a forest. We had a good time though, listening to music and singing along. When suddenly I hear something that sounded like a scream. Did you hear that? My girlfriend said that it was a deer. So we carried on. But two minutes later, we heard the scream again. We heard the scream that second time, followed by the word help from a woman. It was so loud and frightening. We immediately sobered up. The woman screamed for help nonstop. And we couldn't see anything in this pitch dark forest. We were trying to locate the screams, but it was quite hard due to the echo. I said, Hello, we're coming. Don't worry. We thought perhaps a woman had tripped or gotten lost. We called the police in the meantime, and they arrived pretty fast. But there were no screams when they got there. We tried to explain our story to the police. And she screamed again. And then two officers ran into the dark. They found her, but we never got the chance to know what happened there. We heard from other sources that a woman was taken by three men. And I bet you can use your imagination to guess what they did to her. The police told us to leave and that they had to take the woman with them. And they thanked us and called us a taxi. That really freaked us out for a long time. This story dates back to July last year. It has enough weirdness that I find myself puzzling over exactly what happened quite regularly. My friends reactions sometimes make me wonder if this is just a big old self gaslighting experience. But yet, when I go over the details, there is enough deep weirdness that it only leaves two real options. I'll let you be the judge. A few years ago, my best friend Toby took a cross country grand position in Brisbane, a big tumulus thing for our group of friends. And amid the 3am power drunk confessionals and promises to not lose touch was a promise of the road trip. However, life found a way to make our drunk promises seem very disingenuous. And 18 months later, we'd hardly spoken barring a few crowded hours when he'd flown over for a family obligation. Eventually, the stars aligned mid July last year, and myself, Toby, and two other friends, Chris and Alec, were able to get the band back together. Queensland is a weird mix of tropical paradise, dead space, crocodiles, and genuine social backwardsness. Queensland is very, very much the Florida of Australia. Australia is huge. Not just huge, but vast and extremely empty. There is on average 3.1 people every square kilometer. And 90% of those people live in seven or eight major cities. If you think Reddit is an echo chamber, you've never had the pleasure of sinking a few cooling through these with a good old boys in outback Queensland. The Australian geography makes it really easy to get 100% removed from society and is something I often appreciate about the country. But the distance can be daunting at times because if things go wrong, nothing is close. Everything is amplified by distance. Our plan was to fly in, cram four dudes and two weeks worth of supplies into Toby's family sedan and straight book it 1600 kilometers north from Brisbane to Cairns. Being fiscally unendowed on a time schedule and outdoors inclined, we opted to keep driving most nights until we found an interesting slash free campsite to pitch up in, which was a complex process of cross reference and driver fatigue with the relative passive aggression of campsite comments with the wiki camps app worth every single penny if you ever travel in Australia. Generally speaking, we opted for road stops. But one night after staying too late in a particularly nice town, 1770, if anyone is playing at home, and reading a few particularly average reviews of the rest stop up the road, we decided to go off pissed and camp at an unmarked but seemingly well known campsite. Around 9pm, 
We took a left off the highway, followed the wiki camp's directions towards our campsite, about 2.5 kilometers away from the Bruce Highway. Despite the remoteness, we found the campsite, a small 30 meter clearing between the banks of an apparent croc filled river and tall gum trees already occupied by a single caravan attached to a four wheel drive. Being quite familiar with camping, I felt a little awkward intruding on what I'm sure the caravan owners assumed was a private spot, well after dark, and made a mental note to smooth over any grievances with a cup of tea and a good day. Should we see the owners before we left? We started setting up the camp, despite this frustratingly gravel thick soil. Have you ever tried beating a tent peg into a rock? We weren't being particularly loud, but must have attracted our neighbor's attention because he flung open the caravan door within two minutes of us arriving and started one of the weirdest conversations I have ever had. Expecting a grey nomad couple and a please keep it down, I was surprised by the 55 ish, bushy bearded man that approached us. He seemed erratically drunk and asked us if we had a bong, which we did not. I offered him a beer and he asked where we were from. We mentioned Perth and he asks our names. We went around the group and we asked his. Oh, don't worry about that. And then he cleared his throat and made a joke. You know, I'm a gay prostitute. Mutual unexpected statement silence. Yeah, I'm great. But the other boys don't enjoy it as much. There was awkward laughter. It was also important to note that Chris and Alec were not particularly interested in this conversation, preoccupied with tents. Minimal attention was being paid, and Toby had made more an effort to engage, but was tending to his swag, and I was more or less solely engaged in the conversation. Despite his awful joke, which I talked up to different cultural sensitivities, I asked us if he minded us camping here. And what was he up to tonight? Oh no, I'm just watching the state of origin. Rugby. You know, I'm having trouble making friends. He pondered for 10 seconds or so and then followed up with, I used to have a good friend, but he was a crossdresser, so I had to take care of him. He said it so naturally that my general human statement interpreter thought it was an off joke and auto response had already kicked in by the time I realized what he had just said. Oh, how far is the river from here? Are we in range of any crocs? I asked before my brain could work out. Oh, why? Oh, only 150 meters that way with the shallow graves. You know, my friend knows where some shallow graves are up in Hervenly Bay. But yeah, you know, being out here alone, I wouldn't worry about the crocs. Do you promise not to kill me if I promise not to kill you? This was enough to trigger my dumb lizard brain and a very rapid understanding of danger kicked in. Oh, do you think Queensland will win the state of origin? It would be embarrassing to lose all three games. What's the score anyway? I asked in an attempt to show I'm less scared of the snake than it is of me. Good point. Just come knock if you want some bourbon boys, he said as he walked the 10 meters to his caravan. I immediately turned to Toby and asked how much of that conversation he'd heard. He said not much, but enough to be a little shaken. And I asked if Toby had caught our bearded friend's name, and he replied he had not. I immediately insisted to my friend that we take a walk to the river, despite Alec repeatedly saying, I'll be there in five, just let me finish my tent. I made it very clear that we needed to see that river right now, in the very remote dark, we huddled around a smartphone torch, and I explained the conversation I had just had with our nameless gentleman. Alec and Chris again had only heard this guy being friendly and asked our names and certainly didn't understand why I was being so edgy. Despite my being fully aware that we were in an actual horror movie, I agreed to keep setting up and wait to see if anything happened. I immediately started scoping sizable rocks to use in a mano a mano fight to the end, should it come down to it. And 10 seconds after considering it, I asked Toby what we should do if our mate Mick Taylor happened to have a firearm. 
He paused very briefly, and then very quietly and aggressively, pronounced we should get the hell out of there. We packed up extremely rapidly, one eye on the caravan at all times, and despite protestations from Alec, we got the hell out of there. I still have no idea if this guy was trying to play a big old joke on four mid-twenties guys, or if there was something more sinister behind it. You can get away with a lot more if no one's around, and there aren't a whole load of people looking in rural Queensland. Either way, I'd rather never meet again. My family and I were driving from Ohio to Wyoming one holiday season to visit family about 10 years ago. Due to storms further north, we traveled straight west instead of northwest at first and split the trip at Ohama, staying the night before heading up through Nebraska into South Dakota. Once we were far enough north, we turned west onto I-90. At that point, it might have been over an hour since we saw anywhere that might have a public restroom. And we were on state routes, so no rest areas. Those of you who have traveled with young kids know that's close to their bladder slash boredom limit, and our daughter was begging us to stop somewhere to pee. South Dakota was similarly deserted or even worse as we headed west. Finally, we reached a desperately needed rest stop as my at the time five-year-old and I both needed to pee by then. Just as we pulled in, the truck that had been following us for a while pulled in too. I didn't think too much of it at first until I started to open my door. My head was turned to the right where the truck was parked a couple of spots over. My eyes met the driver and I just shivered. He was a skinny guy, straggly gray brown beard and dark eyes. I could see that he was wearing a dingy, dirty blue plaid shirt, and he got out of his 90s brown and cream truck and started rummaging in the bed. I told my husband I didn't want to go into the rest stop alone because of the guy and the weird feeling I got from him. He thought I was being a little silly, but agreed to come in with us. And at that point, the next stop was Wall, South Dakota, at least a hundred miles away, according to the huge billboards we passed advertising it. He figured he better empty his bladder, even though he didn't particularly feel the need to. I grabbed our daughter and we headed inside, followed by the guy who'd finished rummaging at his truck, but wasn't carrying anything when I glanced back. My daughter and I did our business in the women's restroom and headed back out to the lobby. As I expected, my husband was already out there since he didn't have a small human to chaperone. The older guy was also in the tiny lobby area. He was just there, glaring at my husband. My husband rushed us back to our car, and as we were buckling in, he locked the doors. Then he told me that the guy hadn't even gone into the restroom and was just standing in the lobby the whole time. He agreed with me that we might have had a close call and was glad that it hadn't just been me and our daughter there. However, that's not the end of the story. Remember how I mentioned Wall and that it was a hundred miles away? Well, that was a hundred miles of pretty landscapes, but a decent number of turnoffs from the interstate. We didn't see the truck following us and through the whole episode was completely behind us except when we stopped in Wall to grab lunch and some road snacks. Plus, look around this homely but fun little tourist trap in the middle of nowhere. We saw the guy in the store not 20 feet from us, same face, beard, dirty plaid shirt. Thankfully, we'd already eaten. So since he was staring at us again, we quickly paid for our snacks and trinkets and got the hell out of there. We didn't see him again, but I was seriously creeped out until we reached our relatives in Wyoming safely, with no other sights of that accursed truck. Last year, I moved to rural Australia from the city to do some farm work with my boyfriend. He's from the UK, and to allow a second year visa, he needed to complete 88 days on a farm, so I quit my job and went with him. We stayed in a working hostel, and people worked in farms all around the area. 
We lived slightly out of town, close to the highway, and about 15 minutes from the beach. My boyfriend managed to get a job before I did, which meant a lot of boring days by myself at the hostel. It was early in the season, so there weren't many backpackers yet. Anyway, one of the boring days I decided to maybe go to the beach, so I drove into town. The town is surrounded by three beaches, like a square on the edge of the sea, if that makes sense. One of the beaches was a bit further away, and I hadn't been that many times, so I thought I'd check out the other one instead. It was the middle of the day, and this is a small town and there's no one else around. I pulled in the car park, and as I did, I noticed another car pull onto the car park too. It was a tradesman work van, with a company logo on the side. For some reason, I didn't get out of the car right away. I just had a funny feeling. I look over into the van about two car spaces distance between ours, and the guy looks at me and stares. He was an older man, I'd say mid 40s, and had a very blank expression. The feeling of uneasiness I messaged my boyfriend, telling him I was at the beach just in case. While I'm doing this, Van Guy jumps out of his car and walks in front of my car along the path to the entry of the beach and heads down it. The path down to the beach is fenced to protect the sand dunes, so there's only one way in and out the beach area. I remember thinking it was weird he was walking down on the beach as he was in jeans and a button down shirt and black shiny business shoes, strange attire for a sandy beach in Australia in 35 degree heat. I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling, but I also could just be thinking the worst of this situation. Just to be safe, I thought I'd drive to one of the other beaches on the other side of town just to be sure. By this time, Van Guy is out of sight and presumably down on the other beach. So I pull out the car park and drive over to one of the other beaches. Now I have to explain the layout to give a little perspective. This other beach is on the complete other side of town, not on a main road, and you really wouldn't want to head down there without living nearby or heading to the beach. The entrance to the car park is a small one way road that is like an L shape with cars parked along it, and then an exit at the end. It's a small car park with a street just over the other side with only a few houses on it. So I pull into the empty car park, park my car in the first space, grab my beach bag, and as I'm about to get out the car, I see a van in my rear view mirror. It pulls over quickly across from the street from the entrance to the car park. This time he doesn't get out. At this point, I was too freaked out to get out the car. It just all seemed too weird. So I quickly drove home and stayed inside the rest of the day. I just couldn't shake that weird feeling. A lot of strange things happened in that town. It was like a pass by town people traveled through a lot to get to major cities. Yeah, this encounter was strange though. I never saw the man or his van again, but I didn't venture out on my own after that. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked down on the beach path. Was he waiting for me? The other thing is that he was at the other beach literally seconds after I was. So that would mean from where he was, he would have had to run up the beach pathway, get into his car to be there that fast. And why park right opposite the entrance to see if I got out my car? These are the questions that have bothered me about this scenario. Do you think I'm paranoid? Or did he have any intentions? I guess we'll never know. We live in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. The closest neighbor is about 900 meters away by road and 600 if you cut through their forest. We have lived here for quite some time and never really had that much of a problem with the neighbors. My mom has four large dogs two being Alaskan Malamutes, one Husky Malamute mix, and one German Shepherd Malamute mix. They bark at things they see. If they see hunters or deer or moose on the far side of the field next to our house, or whether it's a car, driving or people walking down our road, they bark loudly. And when I say our road, I mean our road. It's about 200 meters long and leads only to our house and away from it, with no other properties. One of the dogs 
is inside at nights, two are inside a fenced area, and one is outside the fenced area, on a chain leash connecting to her doghouse. They really are the sweetest dogs and wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, maybe a fly, but never people. They do have a large problem with running away though, meaning that if they somehow got loose, they stay loose for a few hours roaming other people's property, unless you catch or lure them back within seconds. They come back on their own after maybe three to five hours, but we try to find them and catch them before they cause any harm on others. One night, around 3am, my dad gets a phone call from a blocked number. Being all groggy and literally just waking up, he answers it. The male voice on the other end says aggressively, make your dog shut up before I call the police and animal control. My dad apologizes and the other person hangs up. My dad got up worried and goes to check on the dogs. I know you're getting ahead of yourselves, but our dogs are still there. They all seem to have just woken up when my dad walked out. And now he's being a bit annoyed, as he's being threatened for no reason at all. So if they had been barking, the police couldn't find him, and animal control couldn't either, considering the dogs were healthy. A month passes and we all forget the strange call. The next occurrence may not even be by the same person, but I wouldn't be surprised. My parents get up, make coffee and go out for a cigarette as they normally do. They sat there for a moment until they saw one of our dogs laying on the porch next to them. The dog watched at them with guilt in his eyes and as soon as our other dog came running from behind the house, wagging its tail happily, the third dog on the chain leash started howling. At this point, my parents went to check to see if they had closed the door poorly. The fenced area was quite large, built with thick metal net supported by poles, about 2.5 meters tall. The door was a frame with the same metal net, but strengthened with a piece of tin paneling at the bottom because the dogs have once wiggled through it. But the problem wasn't the door. They hadn't dug their way out or magically jumped their way, no. In the back of a fence, there was a large hole cut with metal cutters. Around the hole were muddy footprints and my parents called the police after taking the dogs in. Somehow the police didn't see the problem and said that it was likely the dogs that had chewed their way out. Those words literally came out of their mouths. Our third dog was probably not let out because she has the meanest bark you'll ever hear. She literally will roll over if you go closer. But the culprits didn't know that, so they went from the back. My dad bought a hunting camera. Unfortunately, no one went there again. Maybe the scariest part of them being let out of the pens is that it was hunting season and a hunter could have shot the dogs during the night. We once found a plastic bag with raw meat outside our dog pen. Obviously it was thrown out immediately, but it still creeps me out. And the whole ordeal is just so weird. Maybe it was a messed up prank and the consequences were unclear to those doing it. Maybe they tried to catch the dogs, but they were too fast and strong. Maybe they wanted to send a message like that maniac, but it certainly made us feel on edge for a while. I live in rural Australia, in a neighborhood a few kilometers away from a small town next to the beach. This neighborhood is pretty much just thick forest, some roads and maybe 20 houses scattered around. I get dropped off from school at a bus stop with a neighbor where I have to walk about a kilometer through thick bush and forest to get home. One day when I was in sixth grade, I was on the bus home from school. As we got close to my neighborhood, I started seeing more and more police cars parked on the side of the road, and even an NRMA helicopter flying around. Me and my friends thought it was weird, but didn't think too much of it. I got off the bus with my friend and noticed that their mum was waiting for them. Again, a bit strange, but nothing crazy. I said goodbye 
and started walking off when my friend's mum called me over. I walked over and she told me that there was a shirtless, panicked man on the loose in our area. He was also wounded and had a weapon that the police wouldn't disclose. She said that he was meant to be extremely dangerous and that I should come home to her place instead of walking home through the bush. I was scared, but I got to my friend's house so I didn't complain. On the drive there, we made up heaps of theories, but none of them turned out to be true. We got to their place and I just hung around until my mum could leave work to fetch me. I got back to my house and started talking to my mum. By now, there were police cars everywhere and about 10 helicopters scanning the area. My mum and dad said that the police had told them his name and some more details about him. He was an addict with a bad criminal record that had apparently been wounded in a fight and ran off. He was rumored to have a firearm and was apparently in our backyard at one point. At the exact time I would have been coming home from school. That was close. The helicopters kept on tracking him by report and sightings and eventually he left the area. Later that night, police called up the residents and told them he had been caught. We slept okay knowing we weren't gonna perish. But the next morning it turned out he hadn't actually been caught. I can't remember who told us, but he was certainly still on the loose. It was also found out that before he came to our neighborhood, he had assaulted a woman and stolen her car and drove into our area because of the kilometers and kilometers of thick forest to hide in. A bunch of other stuff also came up involving in drug trafficking and that he had been crashing with some drug dealers in one of my friend's neighboring houses. There were a bunch more things that led me to believe there was something else very fishy going on. The police got sniffer dogs in later that day and they kept searching to no avail. After a week, he still wasn't caught and a class trip had to be canceled because he was still in the area. But some weeks later, they finally apprehended him. And that case was closed. There's still a lot of confusion and some weird things that happened and the police won't share any details, but he was caught. So that's fine, I guess. I'm an avid hiker. And when I can't make the hours plus long drives up to the mountains, I enjoy nice hikes near my home. This one particular hike near my home is five miles in many different directions, like a goosebumps book of sorts for hiking. You can only see the trees and the greenery on one hike or a massive waterfall on another, follow the river on another or see the abandoned and dilapidated mills from decades ago on a different one. I went to the waterfall this time. I was about two and a half miles in and I sat and did some work enjoying the serenity. When I was ready to leave, I looked around and saw a family of father, mother and three kids nearby. I packed my things back into my day pack as they left. I am a major people hater. I prefer to hike in areas where there are no people for miles. I choose to go a different way back to the trailhead than the way I came because I didn't want to run into this family for the next two and a half miles. I checked my map on my cell phone and found a route that I could take that seemed remote enough. I immediately noticed that this trail was not man-made, but just probably what was left after some flooding. It was going up river away from the waterfall and I was so close to the river all I had to do was walk out on a bent tree and I could touch the water. It was a very thin trail, not big enough for people to walk side by side on and was covered in thick roots. I enjoyed this, it was peaceful. I passed some girls who had hooked up hammocks to read about 20 feet to the right after I had hiked this little path for a while. And I had nothing but the sound of slow flowing river to my left until I heard lots of footsteps coming from behind me. I didn't want to deal with people behind me. So I stepped out onto a tree that hung over the river and waited for them to pass. It was that family from the waterfall. I could have sworn they went in the completely opposite direction, but whatever. I waited a few minutes before I began walking again 
as I didn't want to run into them. Pretty soon their voices disappeared in the distance and I was able to go back to enjoying the peace and beauty around me. I hiked for another five or so minutes when I had to turn a sharp corner around a boulder at a major bend in the river. This man, the father, was standing there on the other side, crouched down like he wanted to scare me. I screamed and he laughed. I got angry and noticed that his family were no longer where we were. What's wrong with you? Not bothering to control my anger at being snuck up on by some stupid idiot, but he wouldn't stop laughing. I realized I was dealing with a moron, maybe a psychopath, and I didn't want to deal with him either. So I turned around and booked it. I could hear him behind me following. He wasn't a very big man, maybe five foot six, 180 pounds, but he was keeping pace about 20 feet behind me. Let me tell you that this path is not for running. I very nearly went sideways into the river a few times, but this gave me a few ideas too. The routes I could mostly handle, I knew the terrain and the park pretty well. As long as I focused on my quick paced steps around the thick root system and keeping my balance, I could make it. I was running back towards the waterfall where surely there would be people around. It was a straight shot, but then I remembered the hammock girls and I remember that they were slightly hidden. And if I picked up speed, the dude behind me would miss me turning because of the natural curves in this path. I sprinted on the trail and burst into the hammock girl's area. I spotted a quick and quiet explanation, man following me, and they hid me behind the lowest hammock. It took us about five to 10 seconds maximum to get it set up, and the three of us watched to see if this guy ran past, as I would be hidden safely. I stayed with the girls for a few more minutes after he had passed explained the situation and catching my breath, and then went back the way I came up river, as I didn't want to run into this dude again. You think it's over, right? No. I again hiked up river on the trail, my original remote path back to the trailhead. I tried to calm myself down. I couldn't get my mind to stop thinking that I was being followed. I just tried to hurry and get out of there as fast as I could. I turned a sharp right at the boulder that the man was hiding behind before, and I kept pushing through the rough trail, and I tried to focus on the sound of the river that was still to my left, but I couldn't get the sound of my heart out my ears. The sound of my pounding heart morphed into the sound of footsteps in an instant, and I realized I was being followed once more. I looked back, and guess who? This damn guy again. I got mad as hell, stopped and turned around and yelled at him to stop following me. I yelled profanities and I threw a damn pine cone at him. He just smiled with a toothy grin and kept walking slowly towards me as it bounced off his shoulder. He wasn't phased by it. He just kept smiling. What he did not know was that I am an army combat veteran and a domestic violence survivor. I have PTSD from both and have skills that many don't. The dude chose the wrong girl to mess with that day. I'd had enough. I already hate people enough, but this guy was crossing a million lines. So I charged him. He finally wiped that look off his face, and I was seeing red, because I will not be made to feel unsafe in the only place I felt safe since I got a divorce and went to war. Seriously. I ran directly at him, knocked him down with the force of my body crashing into him and screamed at him and hit him blindly. I grabbed his hair at the waistband of the back of his pants and started dragging him to the edge of the trail. He was the one yelling at me this time. Every time he fought back, I gave him a swift kick and gave him several explanations for why his behavior was uncalled for. And then I unceremoniously kicked him into the river and told him to cool off and not come out until I was gone. I turned back in the direction I had been walking in before and decided that I needed to take another detour just to be safe getting away from him. That also was to get away from more people. I knew there was a trail parallel to this one that I was on to my right, and I looked around for a clear place to climb up the steep hill 
which was mostly granite and moss and ivy. I hadn't planned on impromptu rock climbing that day. But whatever, I found a spot and began climbing until I got scared by the three guys sitting in the middle of the hill on a very small mossy flat smoking weed. They were quite hidden. And once I caught my breath from the shock and climbing, I asked if they heard me screaming, and they said they did. But they thought I had it covered. I rolled my eyes and told them to kick anyone down the hill that tried to follow me and continued on. It took me a while to cover the two and a half miles back to the trailhead that day, taking detours and hiding randomly. But when I did, I called the cops and alerted the park ranger about the guy. I don't know any other details on that. The cop laughed and said, good for you when I told him what I did. Honestly, I doubt they did much because I never heard back. And I sadly have not been back to that place. I just want to state before I share this, that I don't agree with violence, but I wasn't getting out there without it. I just want to hike in peace. And I would absolutely prefer it if I could do it alone and safely. And thank Cheez-Its for those hammock girls. I come from a chaotic upbringing. I was born and raised as a child in South Korea, and then later moved to Australia with my mother having lost my father in a homicide. The next few years of my life in Australia were difficult. Meeting and making friends was challenging in the early noughties, particularly since I was quite nerdy and didn't speak much English, something most Australian kids at the time did not relate to well. One of the scariest moments was from when I was age 12. At the time, it didn't even occur to me how close I was from potentially losing my life. My mother and I were on a road trip heading south from Melbourne to stay on the southern coast. We had stopped one evening at a small, well-kept caravan park. The caravan park was quaint and beautiful, neat grass, nice flowers, and a small creek which ran along the edge of the premises. It reminded me of home. I spent some time walking around on my own as my mother was taking a nap, and I discovered a game and a pool room. I went inside and spent probably a few hours playing pool by myself and generally just mucking around when a young boy came in. I was very shy, and so was he, so we eventually talked for a little bit and became friendly. I don't remember playing any games with him, but I do recall him being pretty nervous. He kept asking me if I wanted to go back to his caravan as his parents were making dinner soon. At first, I wasn't interested and said no. We spent some more time doing things and talked as it got later, and he became more pushy and asked me if I liked cake and lollies. Of course, I said. I followed him to his caravan, which was much older than ours and quite dilapidated. He asked for me to wait outside while he spoke to his parents. I waited patiently for a few minutes until the door opened and a large older man with glasses and no shirt opened the door and asked if I would like to come inside for cake. I was scared, but I remember feeling like I had to, like it would be rude for me to leave. And as I walked into the door, I heard a man shout behind me, Hey, what's going on here? I was quickly grabbed from my collar of my shirt or dress, and the man then quickly tried to lock the door behind me. However, the stranger was too quick and burst in the door. He took my hand abruptly and pulled me outside and we ran. The man asked which unit room slash caravan I was in and took me straight there. We went inside and my mum yelled at him asking what he was doing there. I was hiding in the corner crying while he explained what happened. We packed up and left that night. I was already heavily on anxiety medication after what happened back home and we never spoke of it again. My mother claimed it was something I should talk to my therapist about. Every time we spoke about it, my mother would leave the room. It scared the hell out of her. And I did not really understand why. I guess at that age, it's difficult for the brain to comprehend the reality slash potential of a situation. Looking back on it now, it scares me to the point of losing sleep. I'm just glad that Good Samaritan possibly saved my life. When I was six, my family and I went on vacation to Morocco. 
It was a very nice place. We visited a lot of different towns, and we even went to the beach to swim and have a nice beach day. In total, we stayed about three weeks. One of the weeks, we had a plan to rent a 4x4, and go into the desert to explore and go to towns and resorts. So the first day of our desert expedition, we woke up early to the 4x4 and drive off into the desert. We would stop every 30 minutes or so to walk around a bit and play in the sand and take in the beauty. It was a very fun day. And that night we stayed in a hotel so we could leave early and do more exploring. The next day, we were driving along like normal. And then my parents wanted to stop for lunch in the middle of the desert. We had lots of food in our car, and my brother and I were happy to have time to go outside and play. We had lunch, packed up, and just when we were about to leave, we realized we're stuck. The 4x4 wouldn't move. It had sunk into the sand, and we were stuck there for about five hours. My family didn't seem to care much, but I was crying and freaking out, yelling for help. I thought we were going to die, even though we had enough food for days. Then, just when my parents were starting to get stressed, do we see a car in the distance? It was coming towards us. We were saved. The men from the car helped us get our car out the sand, and even offered to take us to an inn that belonged to their friend. We were very grateful. They drove us in their truck, towing our truck for a few hours, until we arrived to this inn in the desert. It was a very nice place, with traditional walls and nice scenery. My brothers and I went outside on a little sand dune to play in the sand while my parents spoke with the men. They helped us make sure our car was running normally, and they were very nice and hospitable. We didn't think anything of it. I was playing outside when it got chilly, around 7pm, so I went back in to fetch a sweater. And when I went inside, I saw my dad hiding around the corner listening to the men speaking to each other in Arabic. I didn't think anything of it. So I went to get my sweater and went back outside. Night came and we went to bed. I was in a room with my mum and my brothers were in the room next to me with my dad. At 2am my mum woke me up, told me to get dressed because she wanted to go on a little walk and we left the room. We got my family, got in the car and left, and never went back. I didn't understand why, so I assumed we were just driving around and we spent the rest of the vacation in towns. I didn't know this at the time, but my parents then told me the full story. My dad overheard the man talking about how someone would come pick us up in the morning. When my mum was sleeping, she said she saw a man with a knife come into our room and hide in our closet. They were human traffickers who went around the desert rounding tourists up and selling them. I live in Australia, so it gets quite hot even during the night, which leads us to leaving the windows open a fair bit for air. But every so often I will hear this kind of otherworldly purr from outside the window. It's like nothing I've ever heard before, but it's always very quiet, barely above a whisper. Once I had a friend stay at my house for the night, and the window next to my bed was open. We were playing a Pokemon Nuzlocke together, and then suddenly, there was a loud growl. But from an animal I'd never heard before. It scared the absolute crap out of both of us, and we went straight to bed. In the Christmas holidays, I went to see my family and my sister was there, and I'd asked her if she'd ever heard anything similar. Because my room used to be hers before she moved out and she told me she used to hear weird growls and other noises outside her window at night. As of the time of writing this, I'm kind of freaking out. I've only heard this one time, but it was hot, and I opened my window about 10 minutes ago and heard it again. Am I looking too far into this? Or is this a strange animal? What do you guys think? Because I am decidedly unsure. <laughs> 